Hello, my name is Gary Mansfield and this is the Ministry of Arts podcast where each week I'll be speaking to a different artist. Now let's begin by bagging these bongos. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Ministry of Arts podcast. This is episode 219. Firstly, as ever, Patreon supporters, thank you very much for that support, without which we would not be able to produce this podcast. And if you like what you hear, the Ministry of Arts Instagram profile has got a link tree box in which you will find a buy me a coffee function, where, if you so desire... You can do a one-off donation, which is roughly the price of a cup of coffee. And if not, that's absolutely fine. Well, on today's episode, our guest is Sarah Graham. And Sarah has got a properly fascinating story. So Sarah's story involves bipolar. She had several years of very dark depression. And on the flip side, there were some really quite bizarre episodes of psychosis. And it's Sarah's recollection of these episodes of psychosis that really is fascinating. And for weeks on end, she was living a life where the narrative of which was just made up in her imagination. And her memories of these events are as if they really happened. During her darker days, Sarah spent literally hours talking to the guys at the Samaritans. And as a sort of thank you, Sarah's created a project where she has stenciled a VW camper van and given it to artists to complete their own camper van. And it is perfectly called Samara Vans. So if you're an artist and you want to get involved, Sarah's contact details will be in the show notes of this episode. And I think that's also a perfect point for me to say that if anything Sarah and I speak about in this episode makes you feel uncomfortable or might remind you of a little bit of your own darker past, then please do switch off. And if it goes beyond that and you feel like you haven't got anyone to talk to, then then the Samaritans would be an ideal number to call, right? And if you was fine with this story and like to hear the stories of other people who have entered secure units who are now creatives, then please go into our back catalogue and look for Ben Wakeling and Stevie by the Sea. Another two absolutely perfect people who are advocates for mental health. Oh, and I'd just like to thank Amy Billington for connecting Sarah and I. And in turn, I'm going to connect you with Sarah. So come and join me as I speak to Sarah Graham. Bought a house in Letchworth last year. So Letchworth's got a great art scene, really. Yeah, it's got a fab gallery called The Broadway. It's got a few artist collectives and group studios. And yeah, it's a good, good. hub for creatives. Good. Um, yeah, uh, I've been, yeah, I've, yeah I've, I've known of your work for, for a fair while, really. I mean, I didn't know your story in depth. Okay. I knew that there was, um, it revolved around or it tied in with mental health issues and yeah they're, yeah, they're the sort of people with a story just make it so much more yeah. interesting. Well, I've, I've certainly had my share of challenges. <laughs> I know, <laughs> we'll come to those shortly. Um, how would you explain what you do to someone that doesn't know your work? Okay, so the term that comes up most when describing my work is photorealism. Yeah. But I do think, I don't do slavish copies of photographs. That's not what I'm about. I'm not, you know, a hyper-realist. I'm almost, um, they're super real almost. Like I enhance the colour, you know, I enhance shadows and, and, and try and create paintings that are so vibrant that they're, they're almost, <laughs> is this a fact, they're realer than real? <laughs> <laughs> that is the terminology. It is now. <laughs> um, and you know, and I think when you, you know, it's easy when you see my stuff online and it's all shrunk down to the size of a screen that it, yeah. it looks very photographic. But I think when you see my work in the flesh, so to speak, you know, you can see the pain, you can see 
that is evidently a painting, you know, yeah, and yeah. um but but for ease of description, you know, when I talk about myself, I do refer to myself as a photorealist. Because your your paintings are generally round about a meter square, is that correct? Yeah, on average. Um, you know, I I I've been doing some little dinky miniatures just yeah. recently. Yeah. Um but they, and they go up, I mean, the biggest piece I've ever done was about, it was a diptych, about two and a half metres across. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but I, I like to work quite big. Um, I don't really know why that is. I think it sort of suits my mark making and my brush work. Um, I just feel quite comfortable. But then it's also nice to do smaller pieces and get something out of my system quicker. Yeah, because, that's, um, that's fair enough. Yeah, some of my larger pieces can take, I mean, on average, a month. I did a piece recently that took six weeks. So, but yeah, it varies, you know, depends what mood I'm in. <laughs> well, I was speaking to someone earlier and we was he, he mentioned something similar about doing a smaller artwork just to yeah. get it out. Yeah. And it is almost as if that's exactly what you're trying to do. You're trying to just get out this... Uh, you're trying to answer an unasked question, aren't you? you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I I'm actually quite an impatient person. <laughs> like, and because I have the photograph that I take myself, actually, I've got a little pho photography room within my studio. Yeah. Um, so I always work for my own photographs. And um, it's very, it's there in front of me, what I'm going to be producing. You know, it's yeah. quite... And, and I know that I'm going to be having to put the hours in to get to the yeah, finish line. <laughs> so, yeah. And even though I've just said it took six weeks to do a painting recently, I, I can work quite quickly once I'm going, once I get going. Um, and I do, I, I think it's just because of the size of them, it takes the time. But um, I, I can, I can work very quickly and it kind of, um, it's nice when I'm in that, flow state I suppose <laughs> no it's, that, that's, the, that's the state to get into isn't it yeah yeah and I, unfortunately and I work, and it takes quite, too long to get into that state yeah it does oh yeah it takes several cups of coffee and cups of tea <laughs> but I can be quite furious when I'm working which yeah. surprises people because I think they sit think I sit there painstakingly slowly painting away but sometimes I'm like a demon and there's tissues flying everywhere and you know it's um yeah, so yeah, that can surprise people to know that. <laughs> and did you always have creativity in the home growing up? Okay, so <laughs> so my mum has always said she's a brilliant artist. There is no evidence of this. <laughs> I've got <laughs> single... She's, she's not the only artist to think like that, that's for sure. I've met a couple of those. She always says that we, my sister is very artistic as well. She's always said that we get it from her. I I, my, I had an auntie who was an artist. Um, so there was creativity on my mum's side of the family. My dad was a, a hugely, he, his intellect was phenomenal. He's a very clever man. He loved art. He loved English language. He loved literature. You know, he was very well read. And he really... Um, nurtured my sister and I and our love for art and our passion for art and he bought us so many art materials growing up he actually bought me my first set of oil paints when I was eight years old nice. so um so yeah I have my dad to thank really and he was oh he was an avid photographer so he yeah he absolutely loved photography it was funny because every Christmas he would buy me a new camera <laughs> like, it was like it's another camera dad <laughs> thank you but he bought me my first slr camera you know when i was at university and so yeah i mean my dad's not with us anymore he passed away in 2004 but um yeah i i owe my career to my dad Brilliant. for sure yeah and i have to get her in the studio one day just put put an easel in front of her and say come on then let's prove what it you got. i think she's proud of me I think she still worries that I'm an artist she's been worrying for 22 years that I'm an artist <laughs> and you should get a proper job I should get a proper job <laughs> yes um she's awesome good and when was it you realized that you wanted to be an artist so, so when I was two and a half and I was in nursery school the, the teachers 
were very um, encouraging. They said to my parents, you know, Sarah's got this obvious talent for art. So it was always my strongest subject right through yeah. school and everything. But when I was little, I actually wanted to be an animator for Disney. And um, I used to watch programs about how they would paint the cells. And that really fascinated me. But once I kind of got into education and further education, I didn't think being an artist was a viable career path. Yeah. And I also, when I was at school, all the artists we were studying were dead. So it's, it's not like it was, you know, it, it didn't seem like it was an option. And, and I, I was academic at school and I did do well in my A-levels and all my tutors, all my teachers were saying, you need to get a real job, you know, and keep art as a hobby. Yeah. I mean, to the point where when it came to deciding what to do at university, I actually, I did apply to an art foundation course to try and buy myself some time, but I actually applied to a psychology degree and I got into Birmingham University to do that. Yeah. And then at the end of my foundation course, the, um, the principal of the college came down to my studio and said, I hear you're not pursuing art. I think you're making a huge mistake. And that, oh, wow. yeah, I know. I mean, that changed the course of my life basically him saying that and with my my dad as well he was always in the background saying you should really follow your heart you yeah, know yeah. um because he didn't get that opportunity so um so yeah and I switched uh, I actually got onto my art degree to Montfort University I went to in Leicester mm -hmm. through clearing like oh, literally yeah. two weeks before the course was due to start I mean it was a very haphazard path <laughs> but I you know thankfully I did the right thing and then and then um I still didn't think I could be an artist even once I was on my degree yeah. until the very final year when we did a professional practice module and had to put on an exhibition somewhere in public in Leicester and I worked in a pub part-time as a barmaid and um there were two Two empty floors above the pub and I just asked my boss if I could turn them into an art gallery and he said yes and the brewery said yes and we transformed this fantastic space into a functioning art gallery I started selling paintings from there oh, it wasn't just like for the one show was it a no constant? it, it, it oh, went wow. on to yeah it, it carried on it, it, we used it for the for the course and then we kept running it alongside my oh, degree. Brilliant. So, brilliant. Um, but then sadly, I had to move away from Leicester once I graduated. And um, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it ceased to exist. But, but that was when I actually took myself seriously and thought maybe I could actually be an artist. <laughs> There's lots of things that have happened along my artistic journey. <laughs> Um, but I moved to Reading. There was an art gallery in town, which was a non-profit organisation called the Jelly Leg Chicken, mm. run by this fantastic um, lady, Suzanne Stallard. She's brilliant. We're still friends to this day. And the gallery was a purpose-built gallery space in Reading. It was beautiful space. And I just marched in there one day with one of my degree paintings. <laughs> Like walked into a gallery holding a painting. I mean, Brilliant. how brazen is that? I just, I don't know where I got that confidence from, but I went, went in and, and they were rehanging a show. There was this big gap. So they just put the painting up in this oh, gap. Wow. How and cool it sold, it sold within a couple of days for a thousand quid. Brilliant. It was fantastic. And they helped me find my first studio. They offered me a part-time job. Um, I eventually became a curator. So that really was the foundation of my entire career, Super. you know. It, it only changed for me when my dad passed away in 2004. And weirdly, the jelly actually, because they only had the space at a special rate because they were charity status for five years. So they had to close down that venue. They did move into Reading Town Hall, but the same time my dad passed away, and that's what brought me back to Hitchin because I wanted to help, you know, support my mum. Of and course, yeah. Things had changed with the jelly. And so I, I came back to Hitchin then. So, um, yeah. You mention a lot in your practice and in your personal life about your mental health 
was that triggered by the parting of your dad? Yes. So, yeah, dad passed away in 2004. My, my dad actually um, had bipolar. So I'd, I'd grown up with it and, um, you know, really quite serious. He got sectioned a lot and he, he had type one bipolar. So his mania, um, you know, which is, I don't know how familiar people are, but it's um, the opposite of depression, really. Mania is psychosis, it's euphoria, it's high energy, it's recklessness. It's, you know, a whole number of things. But so, yeah, so... And then losing him was like losing a limb. You know, he, he was my best friend. I adored him. I admired him. You know, his courage that he'd shown over my lifetime, you know, was incredible. And it, it left such a big hole in my life. Um, and then I had a few other unfortunate personal things happen. I had a really tough time at that point in my career. I wasn't selling all that well. I kept thinking, I'm just going to have to, give this up and finally get a proper job. Yeah. Um, Mum was right. Uh, yeah, so I was feeling, I was, I, was, I was struggling and I had my first episode in 2004. Sorry, sorry, 2005, and a year after Dad had passed away. Initially, I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder because it, it, um, it was episodes of depression rather than anything else. Um, it's this carried on for years, you know, um, and then 10 years later, 2015, when I started to show signs that I was having rapid shifts in mood, um, I got diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Well, that 10 so, years, sorry to butt in there, that 10 years that you mentioned, was it a troubling 10 years or did you have a hold of the episodes <laughs> that you were having? Not at all. I, I was very much at the mercy of my mental health. I had really, really bad um, depressive episodes. You know, I got hospitalised several times. Um, yeah, I, I didn't have the tools at that point in my life. I mean, it was it was a hard lesson to learn. But yeah, at that point in my life, I was kind of at a loss. And I, you know, I was I was obviously I was prescribed medication and um, but we just never seemed to get on top of it. And so and, and it would devastate my life. I mean, I could be a depression could last three to four months. Wow. So, you know, I'd fall behind with my work. I'd often think I'd have to give up my studio, wherever that was at the time. I've always had a studio to work from, but um, it was devastating at times. And um, I'm lucky to be alive. You know, I've really, um, I've been to some very, very dark places. And, and then in 2017, I had my first full-blown mania. So I'd had kind of moderate, that's why they re-diagnosed re me bipolar in 2015, because I'd, I'd shown moderate manias and, you know, um, they actually referred to it as hypomania. Um, but then in 2017, I, I had my first full-blown manic episode and it completely changed my life. Um, and I, I was, you know, off the chart in terms of how <laughs> crazy my behaviour was. So you had know, the I, depression gone and just evolved into something else or was it um, like light and dark if you like yeah yeah light and yeah. dark I mean bipolar obviously you've got the full spectrum of emotions yeah. you know mania at one extreme end and severe depression at the very other end and, and I was just going into another mind state um it was triggered by a few things that happened to me personally and and it was scary for people around me you know I was I was I thought I was an MI5 spy. I um, thought I was psychic. I thought I had loads of money. I thought I was really, really rich. So I was just spending money like there was no tomorrow, just absolutely smashing credit cards. And I mean, it was, yeah. And I believed this so now, strongly. The one that you mentioned is the one that I, do, that I did know about, which, yeah. um, which was that you thought you was an MI5 agent. Yeah. And you thought you was like unraveling these terrorist situations. Yeah. So can you remember 
any of those situations you'd found yourself in because it's just like being awake during a dream isn't it yes that's exactly what it's like yeah you know I felt like I was on this it was like an adventure and 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 things fed into it and there would be grains of truth <laughs> I mean I, I did actually go on the MI5 website and apply, do the initial you know, application stage. Right. Um, but then that <laughs> transformed into, oh, I, I am an MI5 spy. Yeah. I got the job, you know, and then that became my reality. And, you know, I was, I was ringing the police all the time to tell them about these terror plots that I was foiling. And, well, actually, on the day that I finally got sectioned, that morning, I thought I was having breakfast with the Queen and Prince Philip, Brilliant. with them thanking me for, for foiling a terror plot that was I thought was going to take place in Hitchin. And I absolutely believe, I remember being nervous. I was getting so nervous. I was looking in the mirror of this bathroom in this hotel, checking my hair. Do I look presentable for the Queen? You know, <laughs> And and what then happened was several police officers turned up and I got carted off to hospital. So I mean, it's, um, it's absolutely fascinating that you can create that narrative and live it. It sounded yeah. like there that it was two days, but it was probably a couple of weeks or something. Oh no, it went on for three months. Fucking hell, yeah. man. Yeah. So and, and I, to be honest, I bet it was a great time of your life in the world <laughs> that you was in. Because oh, you was, I mean, you was yeah. being a spy. You know what I mean? Yeah. In your oh, world, it was great. I do. I look back and I laugh about a lot of it. You know, I was, I, 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 oh my goodness, I took my nephew on some adventures to London. I tell you, he was only, how old was he at the time? He was 11. And um, I used to, we used to get a cab to London from Hitchin. And we, I took him to Sketch for dinner. I took him to the Ivy. Um, and you know, well, and he, he was just, rich, yeah, because I was minted. But honestly, Leo, my nephew, said to me the other day, he said, They're great memories I got, I've got of that time. It was a nice feeling to be really rich, you know. It did have a <laughs> in, in your mind, you fucking was. Oh, you I was ended a lottery up in, winner for a little while, you yeah. Know? I ended up in about 20 odd grams worth of debt. I, I um I used to go on Instagram and just ring up galleries and buy artwork on my credit card. If you have that episode again, can I give you my number? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I flew on an asteroid with David Bowie. It doesn't get better than that. I did hear about that one as well, actually. Of um and this year I did the painting. You, you saw the painting, didn't I did, you? I, I did. I've done about that. Um. Well, yeah, so I, I don't is... think, and, and please don't think I'm just trying to sensationalize, you know, these parts of your life, but they're absolutely fascinating and it's what your work's built around. Yeah. So oh, absolutely. What's your association with David Bowie? <laughs> well, so when I was manic, I used his music as like a protective shield um, because I thought lots of people were trying to harm me. I mean, there was also intense paranoia and as fun as it was at times, it was also very scary at times. Yeah. I thought people were trying to kill me, you know. I mean, it was, um, but I've, Bowie's I've had music... that bit myself, that paranoia. Oh, right. Yeah. Wow, yeah. I mean, that's that's some scary stuff. But, yeah, his music was the shield. And and obviously I had this kind of I, hallucination, lucid dream with the asteroid with him. And, and I came away from all of that feeling like I had actually met him and had a connection with him and it was so strong it stayed with me ever since but I remember marching around the hospital just with his back catalogue um but I just marched round and round the hospital uh, garden you know this um courtyard garden I know it sounds like madness but that kind of helped me to get sane <laughs> um I like the way you said it sounds like madness which <laughs> yes <laughs> but yeah and then I just came away I, you know, and ever since since I've recovered, you know, I've, I've, I just feel like I have this lovely connection to him, which has been just, yeah, one of the better results. But that's just like that. any influence, Sarah, isn't it? You know, if you've got yeah. a strong influence from Matisse or, yeah. you know, Francis Bacon or whomever, yeah. 
you, you exactly. feel like you have got a personal connection with them. Yeah, just yeah, what happens that Yours was during psychosis. Yeah, exactly. Which so, isn't yeah. a bad thing, is it? I mean, you know, you've, no. <laughs> it's what your career is based upon. Yeah, and I mean, my work, it has been my therapy. It saved my life, my work. Brilliant. Sorry, I was about to say, you were saying about David Bowie's records was like a shield for you. Yeah. Mentally, it 100% was, because yeah. you was having these dark thoughts, and it was David Bowie's songs that were reflecting them away. So, yeah, uh, you know, exactly. whether it was real or not, mentally, it 100% was his work, his songs yeah. were, were helping you through that stage. Yeah, I mean, it was just so, it's so, it was such a beautiful thing, really, when you when I look back on it all. Um, I, I've now, after I got sectioned and was in hospital, I, I was under a section for 28 days. And then I came out of hospital and I went into a year-long depression. Yeah. Which lasted from coming out of hospital in October right through to the following September. But in the February, I had three months with a, mod, a moderate mania. And in, sorry, not three months, three weeks. And in those three weeks, I did one painting. I put it on Instagram. It sold instantly. And it paid for my studio for that whole year. Brilliant. It was just remarkable, Brilliant. you know. Um, well, well, whatever hurdles I've had, and obviously I've had quite a few, <laughs> but there's always been something to do with my art that has kept me going. Yeah. Um, whether it be just selling something at that pivotal point. Without my art, I can't imagine where I'd be. Like yeah, it It's almost work. as if it's a, a little message from your dad, isn't it? You know, saying, yeah. no, this is the reason why you, you should carry on, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I do, you know, I feel so strongly that my dad, you know, obviously it makes me sad that in this world, he didn't get to see my success as such. Yeah. But I do believe very strongly that, you know, we carry on in some form of energy yeah. somehow. And, yeah. and yeah, he's, um, I think he's uh, very proud of what I've achieved. Brilliant, and, and rightly so. You, you mentioned about being sectioned, and if I can just jump onto the back of your mental health just for a moment. When you was sectioned, as far as you was aware, you wasn't going into a hospital, was you? No, you I thought going I was going to an academy. Oh, man, okay. uh, please again, don't think I'm taking the piss when I when I like look at this lightheartedly. Yeah. When I when I saw what it was you thought you was entering, I thought it was fucking brilliant. And I'm not convinced yet that you were 100 percent wrong. I reckon there was some truth behind it. And and please tell tell people what um what, what you thought you was entering. <laughs> So I thought it was an academy for people with superpowers. Brilliant. You know it what? Isn't? It was a very modern hospital. And I'm not joking. When I when I got um, taken in, it, it was a blacked out um, people carrier. And you know, it wasn't it wasn't an ambulance, it was yeah. like this really slick car that <laughs> took me there. So and it looked like almost like a bond lair. But like yeah, the building yeah, yeah. was very modern. It's very futuristic. So it it all made sense to me. And and actually, once I was in there, and once I got friendly with other patients, we all a few of us thought the same thing. We saw yeah. ourselves as supreme beings. And how long did that last during that twenty eight days? Oh, I stayed in a state of mania pretty much for the entire stay in hospital. But what they did manage to do was. Um, was calm me down because I wasn't sleeping you know I you know I was obviously once I was in hospital they 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 helped me with my yeah, sleep yeah. and um but I mean I yeah when I when it sounds mad that they let me go home but the thing was I was I was more rational by the time I left hospital but I was definitely still on a high and sadly, I mean, what transpired through all of that was my marriage broke down. You know, my my husband, sadly, he did, you know, he left me and I came out of hospital and it was almost like the reality hit me like a train, 
Like it was just like, oh my God, what has just happened to my life? Yeah. And I suddenly was in, in actual reality and realizing that I'd had this altered state and I'd done all these crazy things and I'd upset people. You know, I lost friends through it. Yeah. And all of those things suddenly just, and I came crashing down. And um, yeah, so that was when the mind shifted from that one state to the opposite you know and I went into this really severe depression do you think that that was the treatment that brought you into that state or was it just your own reality bearing in mind that it was the hospital that got you that possibly got you into that way of thinking I think the um it's a combination of both yeah. so I think medication they gave me definitely helped to settle my mind without a doubt yeah it, it had to so much to do with like the personal factors going on in my life I, I, I think the brain also tries to rebalance itself so I think because I mean I've had psychiatrists explain to me that my brain flooded with dopamine you know so then you know the brain has to kind of reset and yeah, yeah. so in order to do that it had to go to the opposite end of the sort of chemical spectrum yeah, and um yeah. And then I think gradually as the year went on and I did kind of reach an equilibrium again. Yeah. Um, but that took time because I think I'd been to such an extreme, you know, mood state. It, it just took time to heal, you know. And at what point did your relationship with art come back together? So, I mean, I had to, all my friends were saying, you need to get back in the studio. And, and I just, and I had times where I'd come in and I'd try and paint and I just couldn't I, I couldn't think about color mixing I couldn't it just felt completely beyond me and then that would make me feel worse because yeah. it was like I've lost my abilities I thought you know I'm never going to paint again and that was how I'd made a living all my adult life mm. so it's terrifying but it just Gradually, I'd, I'd come in, I'd do a little bit, I would go away, <laughs> I'd like, right, come. and then as my mood started to lift, I started with some quite simple paintings, um, quite small, and and then I and then it kind of fast tracked me for my recovery because as my mood lifted, my painting improved, and then it was like a snowball effect. It all just Came it's back like, to, the, like the confidence growing your artwork yeah. getting bigger and yeah yeah cool. and I, I started with obviously you know my work and you you must know I've painted a lot of chopper chops over the years <laughs> yeah. um so I started with chopper chops you know it was like that was my kind of way back in yeah. to my to my work and it has just been growing and growing ever since I've, I'm four years now without having an episode I'm in remission Last year in October, I got discharged from the mental health team who I'd really? been under for 17 years. Oh man, good on you. Um, so, and, and the gratitude I have for my work, I, I can't explain it. It's just immense. You know, it's, it's given me a life, you know, it's given me a purpose. It's given me something positive. It's like, it's like the antidote to depression. If anyone sees yeah. my work, they'll see it's very well, positive you, and uplifting. Do you think that's why they're so bright and colorful because they are an advanced state of reality just like a, yeah. a mania of sorts that's a beautiful way of putting it yeah it's so important to me that my work is uplifting I don't know why that is it's just always been there I think when I was younger I liked to entertain people and I think through my paintings that is kind of what I'm trying to do I'm trying yeah. to entertain I want people to be you know, struck by the realism and 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 then to have the wow factor and for them to really engage with people with their own childhood memories as well and nostalgia. That all that's all part of it as well. Because I've been to some really dark places, it's like the counterbalance, you know. And I I don't think my work I, I don't hold back anymore. I mean, it's interesting when I look at work from earlier in my career. There was so much darker work that I produced, especially when I was first, so I was with the Fine Art Publishers Washington Green for seven years, and I, I produced a lot of, it was my most prolific years, 
But a lot of the works were a bit darker, actually. Yeah. And it's in recent years, since I've been through everything I've been through, I'm embracing colour. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, there's no holding back. If colour and <laughs> brightness is the antidote to darkness, then, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's why it's there, isn't it? Exactly. Exactly. So Sarah, which piece that you've created do you think has got the strongest emotional connection? Probably the recent one of Barry, which I've called Starman. Um, it's part of a series that I'm calling My Wilderness of Kitsch. What I do with The Wilderness of Kitsch is I incorporate all the still life elements. So all the objects that I put into the paintings represent elements of the person who features so 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 Bowie is in the center of the painting not not particularly an iconic looking Bowie it was one from his absolute be beginners era which is my favorite Bowie track and um so yeah and because obviously it's got an asteroid in the background which represents my, what happened during my mania um it's definitely the most emotional and personal painting I think I've ever done so yeah um it would it would have to be star man for Brilliant. sure and sarah if there was you and five other artists past or present what would your ideal group show be okay i've, I've given this some careful consideration okay because obviously <laughs> there's so many of my course. my the reason i'm a photo realist is gerhard richter Brilliant. So I saw one of his photo paintings in an art book when I was at university and it changed my life. <laughs> um, it just blew me. It was called Betty and, and it blew my mind. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, David Hockney, just because it's David Hockney and it's incredible. <laughs> it's just Super. wonderful. Um, Audrey Flat, she, her still life photo realist paintings really, you know, inspired me when yeah. I was younger and, um, I also was a big fan of Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, I think her colour and, you know, that definitely influenced me. And then I have to put a contemporary artist in there. And Betsy Ensensberger, who's an American, she's based in L.A. She does the most fantastic sculptures of, like, uh, popsicles, as she calls oh, them. Oh, I know. Yeah, Her yeah, scholars. yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, beauty, just, just pop art, you know, fantastic colourful, just beautiful sculptures. And I, I did a collaboration with her a couple of years ago um, where I painted one of her sculptures. So, um, yeah, I'd love to have Betsy in the mix. Brilliant. <laughs> Why not? We all need a Betsy in the mix sometimes, <laughs> <Yeah>. don't we? <laughs> and what do you think you'd like to be if you wasn't an artist? Well, a psychotherapist, I think, um, you know, maybe I could have uh, worked on myself. <laughs> but I, I, you know, that was kind of, um, obviously, that's what I was going to go and study at university. Um, you, you know, I love, I'm fascinated by the mind. I'm, I'm fascinated by what, you know, the experiences I've had, but also other people. And when people share their stories with me, um, you know, which they do, because I am so open, you know, across my social media, yeah. and I talk, you know, very honestly and candidly about what I've been through, it opens up the conversation for other people. And, you know, I, I really feel like I've got something valuable to share with people, because I have recovered, you know, I am in remission. And it gives people hope, you know, yeah. I yeah. recently when I, I go into schools a lot, because I'm, I'm very, you know, widely studied. It's just phenomenal. It's not just the UK, it's all over the world. Wow. Completely blows my mind. But I, I go into schools as often as I can. I'm in a school tomorrow. And recently there was a young lad who said to me, after I'd given my talk, that he'd just been diagnosed with bipolar and that my story had given him hope because oh, nice. he was, he'd written himself off. Yeah. He just thought, this is it. This is me for the rest of my life. And, you know, and I, I gave, I gave him hope, yeah. you know, and, and that to me. So, so I, I'm, you know, it's become as important to me as my art, really being an advocate for mental health. Yeah. Um, I'm a patron of a mental health charity called Poets In, yeah. uh, which is a creative mental health charity. They, they do phenomenal work. Yeah. So, so it's starting to feed into my life, you know, the, yeah. 
you know, the, the psychology is definitely... Um, well, it's a part I, of your life, isn't it? You yeah, know, it's, yeah. It's now that you're just, yeah. you're getting on the other side of it, aren't you, somewhat? Yeah. yeah. And have you got anything coming up? Well, yeah, I'm excited because I've got a solo exhibition coming up in my hometown, Hitchin. We're calling it Homecoming <laughs> at um, Arkley Fine Art. Um, they're a lovely gallery, love them. And um, it's going to be the biggest exhibition of originals by me that I've ever had. And and I think it just means a lot that it's, that it's in Hitchin and, um, you know, and I, I hope... Uh, they're really going to town the gallery with it they're, they're having a lot of fun with it Excellent. um so that's coming up i must tell you i, yeah. I want to give you an exclusive okay if that's okay so By all means. thanks to you and your podcast and the recent episode i listened to with background bob yeah it sparked an idea in me and I have wanted to do something because when I've been ill, the Samaritans have been incredible. It's not, I'm not exaggerating when I say they've saved my life on more than one occasion. So I come up with this fundraising idea. So uh, over the years, I've done a lot of, um, I've also done some stencil art just kind of for fun, really. And, and I've done a lot of camper vans. And I've, when I do workshops and art, classes I get other people to paint these stencil camper vans I just do a, a yellow you know basic stencil and they create something fantastic on it and I thought right I'm going to ask all the artists I know and I've compiled the list and it's over a hundred mm. <laughs> I'm going to ask all the artists I know to paint their own stencil of mine and um, I'm going to call it wait <laughs> I'm going to call it the Samara vans oh perfect and um, and I told um, Nathan actually he he sends his regards to you by the way Brilliant. Um, about the project because like because obviously it was inspired by what background Bob has done you know what yeah. they've done is just incredible it's amazing and, and um, yeah and and like I say you know this will be a chance for me so we'll 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 auction all of the um, camper vans and um, have an exhibition hopefully somewhere of them all and I've already got quite a few artists on board um, so that's really exciting um, I, I am you know and it's a chance for me to give something back because I mean I rang the Samaritans a lot <laughs> a lot you know what, and, more than you rang the police uh, yeah yeah <laughs> actually yeah <laughs> And they were obviously a lifeline to you at the time. Oh, my goodness. I can't. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you. I, you don't want to turn to people you know all the time because no. you don't want to be a burden. And whereas the Samaritans were just always there, always listening, you know, and, and that's really what they do is listen. And, and it just allowed me to express myself and what I was going through and get things like, well, get things out of my head and, and which is so important, you yeah. know, and, um, yeah, and, and I know how much they help people, and I, I, I just want to do my bit to say thank you, really. Um, you was a judge for Britain's Best Young Artist? Yes, On I was. On CBBC. <laughs> how cool is that? How it cool was brilliant. is that? Yeah, was it, it was fantastic. It was really good fun. You know, it was a, an ambition I'd had since I was a kid when I used to watch Tony Hart, you of know. Course. I thought I'd love to be on an art show when I'm a, when I'm older. So so to get to do that was just brilliant. I I mean Ricky Wilson was a presenter and the fellow judge and I obviously I knew Ricky from when I did got to mention the album cover in 2012. Well, <laughs> tell us about Chief. that before you carry on. Yeah, so um so Ricky approached me in 2008 I think it was I'd yeah. just become published he'd seen my work at a gallery in Leeds and really loved it and wanted me to do their third album cover and for whatever reason that fell through I was gutted um but we stayed in touch and four years later he just texted me one day said could you paint the end of a stick of rock <laughs> Brilliant. And um, yeah, and it was the singles collection in 2012 called Souvenir. And I painted this and, you know, stick of rock with Kaiser Chiefs running through it and the name of the album. And 
Um, and then we went on to auction the original actually, um, raised over £10,000 for my local hospice where my dad had passed away yeah. um, and my best friend had passed away in 2010, Lisa. So um, yeah, so that was just a brilliant, brilliant, the whole thing was just fantastic. You know, and it, it was another ambition I'd had since university. So um, yeah, that was amazing. And so it was great to see Ricky again um, on the show. And well, That's not bad, um, is it? That's not a bad no. little story there. <laughs> And, and uh, you know, for me, because I, I, I am so widely studied in schools, it, it just tied in with my career so nicely. And, um, yeah, I mean, I was even, I don't know if you know, but I was on the GCSE exam paper in 2015. Yeah. How was that? <laughs> well, I did, do you know what the funniest thing is? I didn't know. And my website broke when they released the exam paper wow. because so many people went on to it. it crashed. That's pretty cool. Um, and I didn't know why, and, and it was an art teacher friend of mine said, you do know you're on this year's GCSE exam paper, don't you? And I, I was like, no. It's like, How cool is she that? like, yeah. So um, I was in the same sentence as Suzanne. It was amazing. Nice. <laughs> and where can anyone find your work, Sarah, be it website or social media? Uh, so on my socials, it's Sarah Graham underscore art. Um, and you know, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and then my website is um sarahgrand.info. Um, so yeah, that's that's where you can find my creations. And I do a lot of time lapse videos, I've really got into doing those. So, you know, because I want people to see the process, you know, and see, you know, because I think sometimes my work gets overlooked. If people, I've had people say, "Oh, you lovely photographs," and yeah. you know, I always have to say, "Oh, I actually painted that." <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's um, it's quite important for me that people see the whole process from start to finish. Yeah, good. And why not? Really glad that you've got everything under control, both yeah. in the outside world and the inside world, as it were. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, bloody good on you. You've worked hard for both. Oh, so, thank you. Not yeah, not bad for a girl from a council estate, is it? It's um, and that's yeah, that's the perfect, the perfect evaluation of it all. <laughs> Superb. I love it. Right. Well, Sarah, that's all my questions asked. Okay. I absolutely love this conversation, and thank Aww. you very much for your time. Oh, you've been so lovely to talk to, honestly. Like, I, I'm going to keep listening to the podcast. I think it's brilliant. Like, and so you should, really. And um, yeah, and I'm just really grateful that you've you've had me on. So um, more than welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right then, right. I'm going to go. Gary. Have a great thank rest you. of the day. Take I'll speak care. to you later. Bye. Bye. Well, hope you enjoyed that episode of the Ministry of Arts podcast. So we wasn't dictated to by advertisers, we decided from the offset to go ad-free, which means obviously we had to self-fund. So we set up the Ministry of Arts Patreon page. And without that support, we would not be able to produce this podcast. So if you like what you hear and you're able to support the podcast, just go over to the Ministry of Arts Instagram profile. You'll find a Linktree drop-down box, which will direct you straight to our Patreon page. And for the price of a cup of coffee, you can help keep us growing week by week. But if you're not able to do that, that's fine because this content is free for everyone. But leaving a review on whichever platform you listen to your podcast, that really does help us get noticed and anyone else looking for an art podcast. Or even giving us a positive shout out on your social media. Everything is appreciated. But either way, thanks for listening. And until next week, Zadar. Zadar.